Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we'll just give everyone an opportunity to join. I can see there's quite a few people just coming through at the moment. So we'll just give everyone a few more seconds to join and then we'll get started. I think we can we, we can get started. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first of VetCT's 12 minute take home webinars. It's great to see so many people here. Uh, my name is David, and if you're unaware of VetCT, um, VetCT are a, a global provider of teleconsulting and teleradiology services to vets. We recently launched the VetCT app that gives vets 24 seven access to a team of friendly specialists offering support and advice on those tricky cases. Uh, we're really excited by this and getting fantastic feedback so far. So please do download the app from the App Store or Google Play and give it a go. The initial launch was, um, was for the UK. However, for anyone joining us from US and Europe and further afield today, uh, you can still download the app and, uh, and be one of the first to know about it when it's available for you, which shall be very soon. We've even made it easy for you so that you can see there's a QR um, code on screen. If you scan that QR code, it will take you straight to the app. If there are a number of local vets, which I know there are on this call, um, just say this is both beneficial for vets and clinic and local vets alike, and we'll be happy to discuss more with you. Now, the idea of these webinars is that this should be around 12 minutes long. The session itself is being recorded and there will be an opportunity to ask a few questions at the end. So please do add any questions into the Q&A area of the webinar. We will answer as many as we can in the time and follow up with any others uh, after if we don't get through all of them. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Kate Murphy, one of our very own friendly specialists to discuss how to approach an FUO case. And it's over to you, Kate. Right, hopefully you can now hear me. Um, the computer is still telling me that I should unmute myself, but I have. Um, David, can you give me a thumbs up that you can hear and see? Brilliant, I okay. Can hear you and I can see you, okay. Excellent, okay. So what we're going to do in this uh, 12 minute session is try to look at the, uh, the way that we approach patients with uh, fever or pyrexia of, of unknown origin. So first of all, really, we need to think about what that actually means. So a patient with uh, fever is one where the hypothalamus has actually been reset to a higher set point due to pyrogens, which can be from within the body or um, external sources. But it's different to those patients that we see with what gets to non-febrile hypothermia, and those are patients with heat stroke. And those patients will tend to have very, very severe elevations in their temperature, often greater than 41, but it is short-lived and it's associated with a history of something that's interfering with their ability to lose heat. Whereas what we're going to focus on in this session is those patients with febrile hypothermia and Typically with these, the temperature is going to be somewhere around the 39 and a half to 40 degrees Celsius, sometimes up towards the 41, but, but not as high as we see with heat stroke. And the majority of cases that you see with this in general practice will, will probably resolve within a few days. So they'll have a few days of fever. We may never know what caused it. We may think that our treatments have helped and resolved it, but it may just have been something that was going to resolve on its own accord. When we're thinking about the patients with fever of unknown origin, however, these are these patients where the, the cause doesn't resolve spontaneously. So despite some uh, examinations, despite some um, treatments, the, the fever is, is remaining. And so they get categorized into this fever of unknown origin. So the definition really of that is it doesn't resolve spontaneously. We can't find uh, a cause easily, even though we've put in some diagnostic effort. So we can see with this dog, it has a, uh, a sort of abscessated area on its tongue. This for me would not be an FUO case because I found something on my physical examination which I can follow up on. So these are patients where we're really not getting massive clues as to where the problem lies. We do some basic investigations such as bloods. Uh, often we should be combining a urinalysis with that and we may even have done a urine culture and we're still not finding the reason for their uh, pyrexia. We may at this stage also do some basic imaging. It's going to depend a little bit on the case and the owners at this stage. But often what happens is a patient with, uh, with a fever that we don't find an obvious cause on basic uh, assessment investigation may get some treatment. And that might be some non-steroidals. It might be some paracetamol in a dog, or it might be uh, a trial of antibiotics, which obviously people are, are trying to be more um, uh, careful about giving. 
but they still don't respond to that first initial treatment. So when we're thinking about investigating these patients, I tend to take a staged approach. And this approach is looking to, with our diagnostic tests, with our, our physical examination and our history, to try and localize where the problem might be and to try and identify further tests that might be useful for that to follow on. So a sort of stage one approach really is a thorough history and a very, very thorough physical examination. So that means uh, we should also be looking at sort of lymph nodes. We should be looking at in the mouth, looking to see if there's any evidence of dental disease that might be uh, driving this fever, looking in the eyes as a, a window for um, the brain and for other systemic disease, so looking for sort of evidence of systemic inflammatory disease there, and a good neuromuscular and orthopedic examination. And you'll see as we come on, this will help us to pick up some of the differentials that we might be considering. If this patient hasn't already had some bloods done, then we want to get a, a haematology with a blood smear looking for evidence of inflammatory lesions. We want to get a, a biochemistry looking for whether we might have particular organs involved or whether we have inflammatory protein changes. And also uh, getting a urinalysis and, and definitely looking at the sediment to see whether we've got evidence of an inflammatory sediment which could fit with a urinary tract infection. And if there is any evidence of that, definitely a follow-up urine culture. In the dog, C-reactive protein, which is available on some in-house analyzers, can be a useful way of looking at a marker of systemic inflammation. It's not specific, but it does give us something that if it is elevated, we can follow with our treatments and with our diagnostics to see whether our interventions are making a difference. And a fecal analysis, um, if there's no gastrointestinal signs, is probably over the top. But if we've got any gastrointestinal signs or if this is a patient that is raw fed, then a fecal exam can be useful at this point. The other thing we maybe want to do is review any medications that this dog or cat is on to make sure that there isn't actually the potential for uh, a, a reaction to the medications. So sometimes you will see fever and erythema as a reaction to um, antibiotics or other medications. And if we've already had uh, some treatment trials, let's talk to the owners about whether they've seen any improvement. So has there been any response to those medications? Now, the patient here that you can see, this is a patient that has clear changes on physical examination. So again, this shouldn't really be coming into a fever of unknown origin investigation because we've got some lesions there that we can investigate. And this was a, a dog that had been imported from Spain and had leash mania uh, driving its inflammatory and uh, febrile disease. So if our basic initial assessment hasn't given us an answer, we need to move on to thinking in a little bit more depth about the sort of diseases that we might have and how we're going to investigate those. So often in these cases, it's either um, a, a slightly atypical presentation of a quite common disease, or it might be that they have an infection in a location that antibiotics don't penetrate well. So things like um, the prostate or uh, heart valves or discospondylitis, things like that, that, that just aren't going to be uh, effectively treated with standard therapy. So in terms of the overall sort of uh, groups of differentials that I tend to think of in these patients, we certainly want to be thinking about infectious disease, and that could be bacterial, viral, protozoal, parasitic, fungal, or rickettsial. So we've got a massive group of infectious diseases to consider. The history, uh, the exposure is going to be very important in deciding whether that's likely or not. We have then a broad category of non-infectious inflammatory disease, which combines um, just uh, sterile inflammatory disease, but also immune-mediated disease. And as we'll see, that forms quite a big category, particularly in our dog population. We can have tumors driving pyrexia, and that can be either because they are maybe hematopoietic tumors, or it may be that we have a necrotic tumor and, and it's that breakdown and release of pyrogens that's driving it. Then we have what I call my dustbin collection of miscellaneous disorders, and we have things like panosteitis, metaphyseal osteopathy, uh, cellulitis, paniculitis that we'll go into there. And then we have a whole category of animals that remain with an unknown cause of their fever of unknown origin. So if we look at the, the evidence, what are the most common causes of um, fever of unknown origin in uh, dogs. There have been a number of studies. The most recent one published by Black um, from uh, Bristol looked at 140 juvenile dogs with pyrexia. And they found that the, the largest category of dogs had non-infectious inflammatory disease, so 65% with non-infectious inflammatory, with only 13% with infectious, 3% with congenital, 1% with neoplastic, and they didn't make a diagnosis in 18%. Now, when you look at the breakdown of those dogs in the 65% uh, of dogs that had the non-infectious inflammatory disease, 60% of those dogs had steroid-responsive meningitis arteritis, or if you look at it as a total of the 140 
dogs, it was 48% of the total. So it's a big hitter to be thinking about in young dogs with pyrexia. And certainly their um, uh, data showed that certain breeds seem to be overrepresented, and, and we certainly think about Spaniels and Border Collies within that. There have been a couple of other studies. There was one from um, Dunn et al. in 1998, and uh, that was a mixed population of dogs. They had quite a high proportion of uh, patients with neoplasia, particularly bone marrow neoplasia, which really reflected the kind of cases that they see in their area. Uh, an earlier study from um, us at Bristol had shown that, uh, and this was more general sort of spread of ages of diseases, we had around about a third with infectious, a third with immune disease, um, and quite a high proportion of, of miscellaneous. But one of the common themes is whatever study you look at, around about 20% of them will become or will remain undiagnosed. There was a similar study um, out of Bristol and Glasgow looking at cats with pyrexia of unknown origin, and they looked at 106 cats. And the interesting thing really with cats is that a much higher proportion, nearly 40%, have infectious disease, and a very much lower proportion, only 6%, have immune-mediated disease. So when we see cats with pyrexia of unknown origin, we really want to be focusing on looking for an infectious etiology first, and we're not going to be thinking about things like meningitis in the cats. And of the cats with uh, pyrexia of unknown origin, nearly 20.8% of them had feline infectious peritonitis. Other infectious causes that you'll be thinking about, FELV and FIV, Bartonella, Toxoplasma, bacterial cholangitis. So a whole host of diseases for us to think of and look for in those cases. So in our stage one, we're doing our, our good history, physical examination, our bloods and our, ultra, uh, our urine, um, and um, trying to find uh, a cause. If we haven't, we then come to stage two. And I think this sort of slide looks like a shopping list of all the possibilities that one could uh, entertain in these cases. One of the most important things in pyrexia of unknown origin patients is to keep coming back to the patient, keep re-examining the patient and being prepared to repeat tests because sometimes something will have changed and we'll pick up something that will be a little bit more specific for us to follow up. Certainly, if it hasn't been done, I'd be looking at imaging of the thorax and abdomen, uh, either using um, radiography and ultrasound uh, or advanced imaging such as CT. Um, and if we're going into the uh, spinal tract and the brain, then we think about MRI in those areas. But that can be useful trying to find something that we can then follow up with more targeted sampling. I mentioned in stage one that we might think about fecal culture in raw fed animals, and that's certainly important uh, here. And then we move on into making sure if we think an infectious disease is possible that we've tested for that. And I'm not gonna be able to go into detail of what's the best test for all the different infections today because we don't have time, but we have a host of different uh, test options like serology, PCR and culture available. If this patient has a heart murmur, whether that's a new one or it's had a previous heart murmur that may, might have changed in intensity, we want to look at doing a, a heart ultrasound, looking to see if we have changes that could fit with bacterial endocarditis, which might be the cause of the fever. If there are any masses or lymph nodes that are enlarged or palpable, we should aspirate those, looking for whether we have an infectious inflammatory or neoplastic cause. And the same with any body fluids. Once we get to this other side, it really starts to be a sort of, you know, if you haven't got a localizing sign, it's like throwing a scattergun approach if we do all of these tests. So we can do immunological tests like rheumatoid factor or anti-nuclear antibody, but really there are very few um, occasions where that result is going to change my management of the case significantly. It's just another tick in the box. It doesn't give us a diagnosis. The other thing to be aware is that those tests can be positive in patients that don't have lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. In patients, particularly those with a murmur or with spinal pain, we might be thinking about doing blood culture, looking for um, a bacteremia that's causing the fever. If they've got high globulins, a protein electrophoresis can be useful. If we've got any sort of changes around the joints, whether that's joint effusion, reduced mobility of the joints, we might want to think about imaging those and taking some joint fluid so we can see if we've got inflammatory joint disease. I mentioned that steroid responsive meningitis is a, a common cause in uh, dogs, particularly the young dogs. So imaging to assess for any structural lesions and collecting CSF to confirm that analysis is important. And I think with that sort of high instance of steroid responsive meningitis, people can get drawn into assuming that a dog with pyrexia or neck pain has steroid responsive meningitis. And yes, the probability is that most of them will if they're in the young age group. But we also see things like discus spondylitis. Uh, we might see polyarthritis there or myositis or it might be referred pain so we need to keep our minds open in these patients. 
If there are changes on thoracic imaging, if they have a, a cough, we might want to think about airway investigations such as bronchoscopy and BAL. And if we've got changes on the uh, hematology, we might start thinking about bone marrow. Once we start to think about opening the abdomen and looking around, um, if there's not anything localizing on imaging, I would say that's taking it a step too far. And I would certainly think at this point, if I've got no answers about what's actually going on with the patient, to think about some targeted treatment trials, which we'll come back to in a moment. Stage three is very much the same as stage two, but you're getting a bit more desperate here because you haven't found anything yet and you're trying to look for, for answers. So even where we haven't got localizing signs, we might start to do some of these investigations. But again, this is a, a difficult thing to justify going and taking a bone marrow if you've got no changes in the proteins and the blood are completely normal. I don't really find that easy to justify. So these are the sort of cases where treatment trials would be more likely to be followed. So this is a sort of an algorithm overlying my sort of approach to the, the fever case. Um, and the most important thing really is to remember that we take a staged approach and we reassess the patient. So we look at the history and the physical. We really look at whether our bloods are giving us any answers. And then we do some targeted imaging and targeted testing. We don't just throw the whole shopping trolley at them and hope that eventually something comes, comes down and hits. And you'll notice that at every stage, there's the option to do treatment trials. When we look at the treatment trials, we should have some idea of what we're treating. We should be deciding in our mind, are we using a supportive treatment like non-steroidals? Are we using a specific treatment like we're using antibiotics? Make sure we use the right dose and for a decent amount of time and make sure we have some way that we've decided that we're going to decide whether that really was a success or not. So to summarize, and before we take some questions, the most important thing with fever of unknown origin cases really is make sure you're patient, make sure you're thorough, and that's thorough with your history and your physical examination, and make sure you're logical and don't just sort of uh, randomly try to find the answer. Be prepared to reevaluate the patient and re repeat tests to find the answer. Make sure you get good communication with your client because actually keeping them on side if we're getting negative results, actually say, well, this is what it rules out can make a big difference to them. And also keeping them up to date with cost because these patients can be very, very expensive. I said that about 20% of them, you'll never find out what's wrong. But the good thing is with those patients, they usually get better. Might take a little bit of time, but if you can't find a diagnosis, they'll probably get better. And the fever in itself at that level isn't harmful. So thank you for listening, and I'll take the questions that we've got in the Q&A um, now. So um, just bear with me while I move to the Q&A. So we've got one from uh, Bruce. Can I clarify CRP in cats? Uh, yeah, I can. So CRP isn't a good acute phase protein in cats. So it's a good acute phase protein for dogs. It's an inflammatory uh, marker, and it shows us where we've got acute systemic inflammation, but it doesn't tell us the cause. With cats, if you're looking at using an acute phase protein, then we can look at serum amyloid A measurement or alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, and to a lesser extent, haptoglobin. But CRP isn't of use in the cat. It's only of use in the dog. So hopefully, Bruce, that gives you um, clarity on that one. Uh, I can see um, one from Ursula. Over what time period am I doing these tests? So you see a lot of patients with pyrexia of two to three days, normal biochemistry, hematology, neuroanalysis. When would I progress to stage two? In a way, it depends on um, how unwell the patient is. So if a patient is severely affected by their, their pyrexia, I'll progress much faster than if actually they're at home, they're eating, they're, they're just pyrexic, but they're, they're not actually that unwell in themselves with it. But those that are severely affected, really depressed, I'll progress straight on to the sort of second level if we haven't got basic um, findings. Um, and for me, a lot of the cases I see with that will end up with a diagnosis of meningitis or polyarthritis. Um, and I know that the sooner I diagnose those, the better my outcome is with treating it. Um, another question, if we see false positives with rheumatoid factor and ANA, um, if that's common, when should we choose to do them? Well, I can tell you I don't think I've done either of those in the last 10 years um, because I don't really think it changes my assessment. So if, for example, we look at rheumatoid factor, um, we're using that if that's positive to give evidence of an erosive polyarthropathy. Um, so imaging changes of erosion and inflammatory changes on the joint tap, the rheumatoid factor, whether that's positive or negative, won't change my assessment and management of that patient. Um, and with anti-nuclear antibody, it's evidence or it's a tick in the box of systemic lupus, but essentially what we're dealing with is multi-systemic immune mediated disease. Um, and if I've got more than one, so it's just a tick in the box on the criteria, 
it, it can be useful, but it, it doesn't normally make the diagnosis. So that's why I'm not sort of prioritizing those. I usually put the money into to other tests. I think we've answered all the questions that I've had through at the moment. Um, so if there aren't any other questions, then I'll hand back over to David. Thanks, Kate. That was a very interesting. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, we hope you found this first of our webinars interesting. Please do keep out an eye out for any future sessions. Our next is running at the same time, 12.30 GMT next Wednesday. This one's on ocular ultrasound with Marianne Matas. So please do register if you've not already done so. Finally, don't forget to download the app. We will leave the screen up for a minute to see our time to scan the QR code. And uh, thanks again for everyone and hopefully see you next time.